Okay, so it's five after. I guess we'll get started. Um, this is a little talk for you library folks about integrated pest management. And I will start out by telling you what, what this is and why we're doing it. First, maybe I should tell you that I'm a museum person and not a library person. But I think that this is probably relevant to uh, libraries. The Alaska State Museum, where I work, has been monitoring for pests since about 1990. And we started monitoring for the Alaska State Library's historical collections in 2007. And also, we've been monitoring at the State Archives. So um, it used to be that if there were insect issues with museums, that uh, pesticides would be used, or you'd have your uh, mothballs or naphthalene or those sorts of things. But those things make our collections toxic. And they're also uh, toxins that we, as folks who work there and our patrons, then have to encounter. So museums took a cue from the agriculture industry and started using what they call integrated pest management. So with the acceptance that you're going to have bugs in your environment, and it's kind of a good thing that you do, we want to manage them. We want to keep track of who they are and what they're doing and if they're a threat to our collections or not. So what I mean by it's a good thing if you have bugs is if you don't have any resident insect populations at all in your building, it means your building is toxic. And that's not a healthy environment for folks either. So with the integrated pest management program, uh, we can kind of keep an eye on what those resident populations are and uh, intervene if there are things that are not good for our preservation environment. So this is the part in the talk where I tell you what I'm going to tell you. So this is kind of our agenda here for our, our talk here. There's the prevention element where we talk about housekeeping and keeping insects out and not attracting them. And if you are bringing collections-related things, books and, and whatnot, things that belong in your building that might be infested, what you can do to, uh, to mitigate that. Keeping in mind, museums often have, uh, or shall I say libraries often have similar things to museums in that you might have displays, loans of artwork, taxidermied animals, uh, woolen rugs, upholstered furniture, all kinds of other things that you don't want infested besides your collections of books and manuscripts and photographs and that sort of thing. So monitoring is kind of the key part of the integrated pest management system. And I'm going to show you a little bit about the blunder traps that we use, how to recognize signs of an insect infestation, what some of the basic pests are, and what the staff training and record keeping might sort of look like. And finally, if we do have an infestation, what's the response to that? And generally speaking, freezing and trapping are the most successful sorts of responses to that. There is an article that we've got in the Alaska State Museum's bulletin from a couple of years back called Integrated Pest Management Made Easy. So it's a, a simple, straightforward article about what integrated pest management is that's in the uh, Alaska State Museum's bulletin. There's the link. I'll show it to you again a little bit later in the, uh, in the talk. But also, if you just Google um, integrated pest management made easy, it was a very popular posting, and it would come up pretty readily. So on the prevention end of things, what do we do to kind of keep bugs out of our, uh, um, our preservation environment? So housekeeping is kind of a major thing, not only to keep all those tasty crumbs and spilled drinks and things that might attract the pest out, but also to keep surfaces clean so that we can see if we do have an infestation, because bugs usually leave debris and, and mice and squirrels and other unwanted pests. So housekeeping both removes the attractants and helps us monitor for the signs that they might be there. So generally keeping food and drink in controlled areas is really one of the key things to uh, controlling that particular part of the attractants. Sealing ingress is a thing that uh, helps quite a lot, actually. Here's an image of a pipe going through a cinder block wall. And you can sort of see the next room. Uh, where a mouse got into our collections room. And that was kind of the ingress where we knew the, the mice were getting into our collections room. So sealing those sorts of things up. Removing attractants, um, aside from just food and drink, there's also, I hate to say it, but plants are really attractive to pests. And um, uh, there is a, a government agency in Juno that had an issue with large potted plants being a nesting ground for mice. 
and um, insects also really like like the nutrients and the moisture that's in with uh, plants. So the, the insects that come in on plants aren't always the heritage eaters, but they can be food sources for some of the insects that are the heritage eaters. So uh, plants and, and attractants like food are, are things to be keeping, keeping an eye on and being concerned about. The isolation, quarantine, or preemptive freezing aspect of prevention is something that museums do a lot, but I think might be uh, slightly different for uh, libraries and um, collections that have like circulating sorts of things. So isolation and quarantine mean you're not sure if it's got an infestation, so you're keeping it away from your other collections until you can make sure that it is safe. For example, with museums, if they, we have something that's too, la too large to get preemptively frozen in our freezer, we'll put it in a big bag and seal it up and keep an eye on it for a month or so to see if we get a hatch out or see if we see signs of infestation. So that's kind of what I mean by like the isolation and quarantine. There's also the kind of question of cats and dogs, which there are some museums and some libraries in Alaska that do have cats and dogs. And there are some, some aspects of merit to having them around, but uh, it's actually not a compatible thing with the preservation environment, partly um, because of the you know, the issues of a living creature having um, dirt and mud and fur and dander and those sorts of things, the accidents that can happen if they, uh, if they decide to spray or if they're ill, those kinds of messes can um, often be in hidden areas and attract more insects and, and problems. You have your patrons who have allergies to those sorts of things. And um, then you have the, uh, the awkwardness of, of interpersonal relationships if some people want pets in the spaces and, and others don't, especially if you've got hierarchies of supervision and whatnot. So uh, cats and dogs generally are not compatible with library and museum environments in general, but particularly not compatible with the preservation environment. And monitoring. This is the last of the really boring slides, because then we'll get into stuff like that, which I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. I think that's an exciting slide. So monitoring is how we're keeping an eye on what our resident populations are. So um, these little blunder traps are going to catch insects before we can really see them visually. Because most insects that you would see walking around in the middle of the room are only out in the middle of the room because they're sick and they're about to die. Insects really don't want to be seen particularly. They like being in crevices and corners and dark places. So monitoring allows you to know who's there. The monitoring also catches a wide range of species. Um, who have different habits. Some might be out at night. Some of them might crawl or fly or whatnot. And these little blunder traps can monitor areas that are difficult to inspect otherwise, like behind cabinets or under tables, that sort of thing. The traps um, allow you to keep data, um, kind of metrics on which insects you have and how many of them over time, and tell you if you've got an increase of certain um, pest numbers in certain locations in your space. And uh, one of the most compelling reasons to keep these kinds of blunder traps is the environmental hints it gives you, besides just if you have an infestation. It can tell you if you have other things going on with your building, which I'll get to in a minute. And if you are trying to get rid of an infestation, this is how you know whether it's working or not, because you continue to monitor the um, population. OK, that was a really boring slide. Now we're going to go on to some more interesting things. This is what these blunder traps look like. So they come flat, and they're perforated, and you fold them in this neat little triangle. And the inside surface is very sticky. I have a long ponytail, and it's terrible if you get your ponytail in this trap. You'll see in the corner, um, I've got uh, a number seven. I have the traps numbered sequentially throughout the building, and I keep putting them all in exactly the same spot time after time. I have the date on them and the location on them. And I collect them once every three months. So four times a year, I'm monitoring the population. This uh, website that I've got listed here for Insects Limited is where we buy these traps. And you can get a box of 100 of them. They come three together with perforates between them. So that's basically 300 traps for $67, which you know, with shipping comes out to around 25 cents a trap. Right now, I'm monitoring insect populations in five or six buildings. So I probably look at 350 or 400 traps uh, quarterly. 
and it takes me maybe a day to do that. So um, I would imagine most of you have a, a much more modest monitoring situation if you decide to have one of these uh, integrated pest management systems. This is one of those clues to environmental conditions. Here's a trap that we had sitting in a corner and it got soaking wet. So this is a soggy wet trap. And so it's indicating that we had a water issue in a part of our building we're not expecting to have water. So that kind of thing can be a useful hint about what's going on in your building. This is the pest chart for the Sheldon Jackson Museum down in Sitka. This is what our monitoring looks like. So this is the chart that I fill out for this building four times a year. You'll see down on the bottom there's a map of the museum and the office area and the storage area and the blue dots are where we're placing the traps. So you can see they're right next to doors and they're fairly evenly distributed through the museum. It's delicate to put them in a spot that they're going to be catching insects and monitoring populations reliably but not be um, picked up by patrons and discarded or stepped on or crushed, that sort of thing. So in corners, behind doors, under desks, those tend to be good places to set up these little monitoring stations. And you'll see the chart that I have uh, shows the date that I set the trap, which number trap it is, the location, the date that I picked it up, the kind of trap. And then there's a section that I have listed what kind of bug and how many, and then this happened to be one that Scott Carley filled out, the um, monitoring trap. So I keep these and fill them out and I kind of figure out who our resident populations are. And if I see some bug that's a heritage eater or something suspicious, when I print this out, I'll circuit, circle it in red and I'll keep an eye out for it the next round to see if it's some, something that just came in on a patron and is a one-off thing or if I actually have some sort of strange infestation going on. Oh, Julie's just um, asking me here, what is a heritage eater? And that's just kind of what we're talking about in terms of bugs that are uh, a threat to our collection. So these generally fall into two major categories. You've got your um, bugs that eat um, like plant materials, and you've got your bugs that eat proteins. So there are some bugs that eat all kinds of things, but generally they fall in one of those two categories. And a little bit later on, we'll get into the details of who who some of those guys are. Here's some uh, insect debris, some signs that you might have an insect. And you'll see you got a number two pencil here for scale because I think it's really helpful to know what the size is for some of this stuff. Now, uh, to your left, you're going to see this pile of, um, it looks like sawdust or sand or just this, how would you even know? It looks, just looks like dirt. Well, this is frass, which is the technical name for insect droppings. Um, and the way that you tell insect droppings from just sand or sawdust or whatnot is that they're tiny little round pellets. And you can't really see very easily that they're round, but if you have them on a piece of paper and you tilt the piece of paper, they will roll like little tiny balls, so they'll roll all over the place. So you'll see they're very uniform in size and they'll roll when you tilt them on a piece of paper. So that's one sign of insect debris. To the right of the pencil, you'll see these uh, little casings. So when insect larvae grow, they shed their skins. And these are shed larval casings and a few little dead larvae too. And then far to the right, you'll see these tiny little cocoons. There's two different kinds of clothes moths that we're worried about in our collections. They're mostly uh, protein eaters. They eat wool and feathers and fur. So mostly we see them in like fur parkas and mucklucks. We see them in beadwork that's on wool felt. We see, a, we see them a lot on dolls, sometimes uh, rugs, wool rugs, that kind of thing. So that's kind of a, a, some of the signs that we're looking for. Here's a pair of mittens in the Sheldon Jackson Museum collection. And I kind of show you this general picture so you'll kind of see that we've got two mitts here and it won't be so confusing when I show you the close-up. So here's kind of a close-up and sort of to the right you can see brown fur, uh, patchy brown fur. Oh, it's kind of like the, the hairs are sort of all pointing downwards and you can see where a lot of that's just been grazed right off. And on the left mitt you'll see that it's been grazed all the way down to the skin and there's even holes eaten in the skin, this sort of irregular 
eating through. This is definitely insect damage and a protein eating insect. You'll also see on the red trim there's some little holes and some raggedy edges. That's also uh, insect damage from a protein eating insect. And then on the black part you'll see those kind of white residues. Those are um, areas where those cocoons have peeled off and so the cocoons are kind of stuck to the surface. So that's kind of classic uh, closed moth infestation evidence. That's sort of what it, what it looks like. Here's an uh, example of silverfish attacking uh, uh, collections items. So we've got a photograph that has kind of a big scratch down it, which might either be a scratch or it might be grazing by an insect. It, it's hard to tell from this image. I didn't see the object exactly, but the um, board that it's mounted to used to be all this uh, white color, but it probably had a starch in the um, coating, like a glaze on it, and the silverfish have eaten through that and exposed kind of the browner cardboard beneath. So this has been really heavily attacked by silverfish. Again, that thing in common between this and the image previous, see if we can go back to that one, is kind of these like bare patches with irregular edges. That's really a big indicator of insect damage. This image here is the underside of a wooden canoe at the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And you'll see all these little holes. These are flight holes from wood boring insects. Now, the Sheldon Jackson Museum collection came into uh, the state's uh, museum system back in the 80s. Back when it was part of the Sheldon Jackson College, it had a major wood boring insect infestation in the 60s or the 70s, and they required like three or four rounds of pesticides to treat this infestation. So there's a lot of things that are made of wood in the Sheldon Jackson collection that have these kinds of holes in them. And uh, the frass that I mentioned, those tiny little pellet-like droppings, they just comes right out of these holes. If you take wooden objects in the Sheldon Jackson Museum and you tilt them around, that kind of stuff falls out of the holes. So this is what kind of wood boring insect infestation looks like. If you see lots of little holes near each other, this is kind of a sign of that. So Julie's just checking to see if everybody can still hear OK. My little talk button says we're on. Oh, hooray. Thanks, Andy. We appreciate that. So moving on to the next image. So the, the article that I mentioned earlier, um, I wanted to give a sense of the scale in some pictures in that article. And so we kind of came up with this dime and this kind of bug clock. So you know, with the different bugs are at different points around the dime sort of for scale. So this one is sort of the bad bugs, the heritage eaters, so to speak. And the one up top there at 12 o'clock is a hide beetle. It's a, a protein eater. And the two little ones at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock are also small protein eaters. The 1 o'clock is a cigarette beetle and 2 o'clock is a drugstore beetle. Uh, the one at 3 o'clock is called a confused flower beetle. And that's not a major heritage eater. It's more of a um, grain and uh, cereal eater. But we see those occasionally in museums and often associated with um, things like granola bars that people bring into the museum. After that, we've got a skinny little guy at 4 o'clock, the sawtoothed grain beetle, another um, uh, bug that might eat certain things like if you've got an herbarium like we do, like plant specimen collection, but mostly coming in in people's lunches. The little guy with the orange on his back is a carpet beetle. That's another um, wool protein fur eater. And at 6 o'clock, that's what the baby version, the larval version looks like, that real hairy little larva. That's a larval version of the carpet beetle. Uh, at 7 o'clock, we've got a different kind of a carpet beetle called the varied carpet beetle. You'll sort of see that these beetles are kind of similar sizes and, and pretty small. The next one, at, uh, that would be 8 o'clock, is a kind of a classic dermestid beetle. This is the kind of beetle that uh, natural history museums will keep to clean skeletons because they're so effective at eating proteins. Yes. Um, and then at uh, 9 o'clock, we've got a larder beetle, which is another protein eater. An example of your webbing clothes moth there is that kind of beige one. And it's 
I like to think of uh, the button, like if you've got a button-down shirt and the button on the cuff of your shirt is a pretty small button, and that's kind of around the size of what that clothes moth is going to be. So if you see kind of a bigger moth flying around in your house, like the kind that like, likes to be outside your screen door, that's not one of our webbing clothes moths. Webbing clothes moths are really pretty small compared to the kind of moths we see flying around the lights outside and that kind of thing. And then finally, the kind of round, shiny, globular guy is called a spider beetle, and that's kind of another protein eater. So those are some of the bad ones that we see most commonly in Alaska. And then here's some of these guys that are kind of OK bugs that you're much more likely to see on your traps and that tell you a little bit more about your environment. They're not likely to be eating your collections, but it's good to know who they are. So I'm going to start out with uh, 1 and 2 o'clock, of course, are spiders that are uh, kind of curled up. And uh, spiders are easy for people to identify. And the only tricky thing is sometimes a spider's head will pop off in the trap. And the size and shape of the spider's head will be very much like some of the very small bad beetles. So I've scared myself a few times by um, a beheaded spider. Some of the spiders are also kind of fuzzy which um, if the spider gets in your trap and gets out again, you can sometimes see fuzz, like gray hairs, in your trap, which sometimes also happens if a mouse starts to get into your trap and gets away again. Sometimes you have some fur in your trap that way. 3 o'clock over here are um, minute scavenger beetles. They're really tiny, and they're on a piece of tape here. And they look a little bit like book lice. But we'll get a little bit into book lice in a, in a little bit. But um, very tiny, some of the tiniest bugs we're going to see. After that, we've got a weevil, and he's kind of uh, not really showing his most attractive side, which is the elephant-like, nose-like, you know, uh, a weevil has a really long nose-like element, so uh, they're not too hard to distinguish. The little winged guy at 5 o'clock is a carpenter beetle, uh, I mean a carpenter ant, and a lot of Alaskans have issues with carpenter ants. And the good news about carpenter ants is that they're not like termites, they're not eating sound wood. Carpenter ants are only eating through rotten wood to make nice moist nesting environments for their eggs. So a carpenter ant is kind of doing you a favor and telling you you have rotten wood. It's not actually attacking sound wood. Down at the bottom center there at 6 o'clock, we just got your typical icky housefly. After the housefly, we have the picnic ants, which uh, we had a bit of an issue with picnic ants a while back. Um, and a couple of uh, what they call sow bugs or roly polies, those little uh, bugs that you often see under your doormats or areas that are really damp in basements and whatnot. And then at um, 10, 11, and 12, we've got just common ground beetles. Sometimes they're called carabids or fungus beetles. And they're mostly eating the leaf litter outside, and they're coming in inside by accident. So here's some of the you know, just typical pests that you might still you know, be seeing in traps if you start a monitoring system. This is a trap that I saved, and I put in like a little sandwich bag, so that's why it's a little shiny and plasticky on the top. But this is a classic example of a trap full of gnats, like little tiny flying insects in kind of large numbers. If you see this in your traps, basically what's happening is you've got rotted leaf matter, organic matter, clogging up your gutters on your roof. And these bugs are hatching out of that rotting organic matter and getting into the vents of your building and you know, kind of coming in little clouds as they're hatching out. So whenever I see this, I say to our maintenance folks, we need to check the roof because our, our roof is going to start to flood pretty soon. And this was pretty consistent at the old Alaska State Museum that had a flat roof. We would start to get big puddles on the roof when the drains were clogged, and then we'd start getting leaks. So this is one of those examples of how a monitoring system can tell you what's going on with your building in addition to telling you what might be threatening your collection. Here is one of the less disgusting images of our ant infestation. Um, aren't you glad it's after lunch and not before lunch? So this was very unusual that we had a combination of picnic ants and carpenter ants together. We knew for quite some time that we'd had an issue with picnic ants, which are the littler ones that don't have the wings, because someone spilled punch during a reception. And they cleaned it up, but they were unable to move the big heavy printer. And there was a puddle of sticky punch under the printer. And the ants found it and started to come in. So we had kind of an ant issue for a while, which you know, ants are not going to eat your collection. And they're not going to bite you. And they're not hazardous or whatever. But they're kind of icky. Like nobody really likes to have 
ants in their house and you know patrons don't really like to see ants crawling around and whatnot so it's nice not to have them but then we started seeing these ones with the wings which are carpenter ants and he, and both of these in huge numbers in our kids room they were kind of coming out of a hole in the top of this cabinetry area and just swarming like Alfred Hitchcock style it was quite quite disturbing, huge numbers. I'm not squeamish, but it gives me goosebumps to remember this incident. And what was going on was that there was a nest of uh, carpenter ants in the insulation around our drains. So it was a nice moist environment, rather like rotted wood. And we knew something was going on ahead of time, because this is what our traps were looking like. We were seeing um, all kinds of ants and a whole bunch of chewed up material in our traps. So we were able to look at our maps and see where these traps were showing up. And it all it located in three different levels of the building, all in the same corner, which is what narrowed it down to that drain pipe. And we were able to figure out that there were also some trees outside the building in that location that were probably housing this infestation. And what had happened was when a colony of carpenter ants gets big enough, they grow wings and they go to the highest spot they can and jump off and they start trying to find new colonies. And so that's what was going on. They were all going to the top of this drain area and trying to go out into the world and find new colonies. But instead, they were all coming out into our kids' room and making a crazy mess. So uh, that was one of those situations where the infestation just ran its course. They did that for like a day and we vacuumed up huge quantities of them. And we called in an expert who knew about ants and said that the carpenter ants and the picnic ants generally don't live in the same place together. So that was really quite unusual. And for a while, we considered covering the drain with uh, plexiglass and turning it into an ex exhibit and calling it the peace ants. But uh, we just ended up vacuuming them up and, and cleaning up the mess. When we're trying to figure out what to do about insects, we really need to identify who they are. And so there's these various charts and, and uh, aids on the internet that talk about the different body parts. And usually it comes down to how, how readily can you see their head and do they have wings and, and how big are their antenna and do they have little segments and, and some of that sort of stuff. So um, some of that stuff can be handy, but if I end up with a bug that I really can't figure out what it is and I can't figure it out from the internet, there are people in Alaska, entomologists, bug experts with the Forest Service and, and um, in your local area that are probably pretty good at identifying who your local critters are. So your response once you have an infestation, aside from our ant situation where we just vacuumed them up and um, understood what was going on and uh, moved forward from there, the response uh, usually for what we do is we freeze. We bag up the materials that are uh, causing trouble and we freeze them. And the freezing protocols uh, are a little specific and I'll go into that in a second. Chemicals are kind of another option that the whole point of integrated pest management is to get away from chemicals, but there are certain chemicals that are useful. Boric acid is one of them. I mean, it sounds horrifying, boric acid, but it's just kind of a, a more finely ground and pure form of borax, which we use already in laundry detergent and whatnot. And it's not particularly toxic to us or uh, pets or, or whatnot, but it does um, mess up the metabolism and the um, internal functioning of insects. So that's one of the, um, the things we tend to use. If you have silverfish and you put out the little, what they call deco traps, D-E-K-K-O, deco traps are just full of boric acid and they eat their way into there and they get at it and they, and they just die. So there's a few chemicals that are more inert that, uh, that we, we do use. Uh, traps that are like uh, snap traps, or live traps for bigger critters is kind of a, another option. And these other three options are a little more specialized. Anoxic means you're putting them in a special environment and taking all the oxygen out in order to uh, suffocate the insects. Generally speaking, I've only seen that on things like very expensive, very large paintings that have an infestation. In the, like maybe it's a, uh, a medieval panel painting or something like that, like anoxic treatments are uh, sometimes used in that case. Heat is sometimes used in uh, libraries and museums that are in warm climates, tropical places with really low budgets. So sometimes you'll see um, museums and uh, libraries putting things in a black plastic trash bag and sealing it up and leaving it out in the sun 
for example, this is a very low-tech low emergency response to pests. Of course, heating things is sort of artificially aging them, so we tend to pre prefer freezing over heating. And lowering relative humidity, often um, uh, there are insects, particularly the book lice and the silverfish and those kinds of bugs that really like moist, high relative humidity situations. So if you can bring down the humidity in your environment, it's going to um, really slow down the life cycles of those kinds of insects. This is a intimidating looking chart, but basically all it's saying is the temperature you need to kill off the bugs. So each little dot on that chart um, above the big white curved line represents a stage in an insect life cycle for our heritage eaters. So either the egg or the larva or the adult insect. And Often adults are killed at much, much more easily than, say, eggs, which have some ability to overwinter or whatnot. So one side of the chart shows the temperature in Celsius, and the other shows in Fahrenheit. And you can see that right around five days or so, if you get the temperature cold enough, you can be killing off all the different um, parts of the insect's life cycle. So we have a tissue freezer, sort of a scientific freezer at the Alaska State Museum that goes down to negative 30 Celsius. And so we can put anything in there for like five days and be sure that we've eradicated any infestation. But if you have just a regular chest freezer or the kind of freezer that's on your fridge, like the kind that you can buy at Home Depot, some of those freezers are frost free, which means they cycle back and forth between what we would consider a lethal temperature and not lethal temperature. And some insects have the ability to make antifreeze in their bodies. And so we would want to not just put it through one cycle and be concerned that they might be able to survive that. We put them through one freezing cycle of maybe a week and take the bag out for a day or two. And then after the insects kind of potentially start to wake up, we stick it back in the freezer for a week. So kind of that one-two punch of two cycles will pretty much take care of anything in any freezer. It takes a little bit more time, but it, uh, it's um, more effective and cheaper than buying a sort of a tissue freezer that goes down to the really low temperature. It's important, I will point out, with this image to bag up anything that goes in the freezer. Because when you take something really cold out of the freezer again, it's going to get condensation on the outside. So you'll see my finger wiping the condensation from the outside of this plastic bag. If you seal something up in a plastic bag, that condensation from being cold in the freezer will happen on the outside of the bag. And it won't happen on your fur coat or your book or your photograph or whatnot. So bagging it up is the other kind of important part. This kind of um, freezing protocol is described in the article I sent, but you're perfectly welcome to call us if you come upon an infestation and you want to uh, talk in detail about how to address it with a freezer. Here's a snap trap. A lot of folks don't know that a snap trap is the most effective if you position it in this orientation against the wall. And that has to do with the habits of mice and how they like to skitter right along the edge of the wall there. So um, loading with peanut butter or um, uh, cheese whiz is generally what we do. I have a friend who swears by pine nuts, but doggone, I'm not going to give our mice pine nuts. They can, yeah. Sometimes I'll, I've heard of people putting two of these traps side by side really closely in case a mouse wants to hop over one. Um, sometimes you'll see people using glue traps, although glue traps um, are a little harder to stomach. It's, it's one thing to have a snap trap that instantly kills it. It's another thing to come across a suffering tiny animal. So um, I'm, a, I'm more in favor of snap traps than uh, glue traps. And the times that I have done glue traps, it's because I have mice that are too smart for the snap traps. And when I do glue traps, I tend to check them several times a day, you know, last thing at night, first thing in the morning. So as soon as I find a uh, suffering creature, I, you know, bag it and take, put it out of its misery as soon as I can. So at this point, I think maybe I'll take a break and see if anybody has any questions about this. And here's my email and that um, link again. And if we uh, have some questions or maybe some stories of anybody who's had specific problems at libraries, after a little bit, we can go in and, and look a little bit more specifically at individual bugs.
we'll go on to introduce you to a few of the bugs then. Oh, question. Oh, good. This is great information. I didn't know how to play. Sneaky mice. Yeah. So I've had more trouble with mice in my house than I have actually at the museum. And like I said, we've used both the sticky traps and the, um, the snap traps. And uh, like my friend with the pine nuts said, sometimes ch like uh, changing up the bait helps. And the, uh, the little gob of peanut butter or the little gob of cheese whiz, if it's eaten off and your trap isn't sprung, that might be an indicator that you've got a, a pretty smart mouse or that you're uh, not setting the snap trap sensitively enough. Of course, it's kind of nerve-wracking to set mouse traps because if they snap in your hands, they like scare the bejesus out of you. But there you go. Yeah, you know, um, shrews, voles, uh, mice, they, they, they do come in and they do cause trouble. I think, you know, mice, I think, tend to, this is my own personal opinion, tend to look for nests and, and like, look for a home inside more than I think shrews and voles do. Yeah, we did have an incident where we caught a vole. I think it was a vole. Maybe it was a shrew. It was very fat. I'm not sure what it was. But it was in one of the drawers of our kitchen. And we pulled out the whole drawer and we put our cutting board on top of it and drove it out the road and dumped it out on the beach. I wouldn't say that's uh, my first choice for pest control, but uh, capturing it live in your kitchen drawer is an option. So what, what I've got in this image is the book louse, which is, oh, I would say two or three times the size of the um, period at the end of a sentence. They're really tiny. But if you get out a magnifying glass, I think the most uh, notable things is they're kind of translucent, and they have this really big, chubby-looking nose. They're a little bit Muppet-like, and uh, they're not, they're kind of considered a nuisance pest, but in large enough numbers, they are you know, uh, in in books and book bindings and, and paper things. I know that the Alaska State Library's historical collections has some and the archives, where the archive stores their stuff has quite a few. And you can really tell them because they, they are too tiny to get very far onto the traps, but they'll be on the edge of your little sticky traps and sometimes in large numbers. They really like high relative humidity because they really like those microscopic molds and starches and that sort of stuff. And almost all bugs like high humidity because they need humidity for their life cycle and they will go through their life cycle a lot faster with high humidity. So there's there's the book louse. There's kind of a lousy image of a silverfish on a trap, but I'm assuming folks have all kind of seen silverfish. They're kind of long and skinny and they have big antenna-like sorts of things. And they are much more damaging than the book lice. They uh, can do that damage like we saw on the photograph, uh, grazing surfaces off of things, glues and starches and, and that sort of stuff. And they will also kind of go after um, some textiles, often grazing on the surface, making this kind of ab abraded look on the surfaces of things. But uh, as I mentioned before, these deco packs, D-E-K-K-O, you can buy them from uh, Amazon.com or Insects Limited, and they're pretty effective. I think the historical library here had more silverfish than they wanted once, and they got the deco packs, and they had very little issue with them after that. They're very effective. This is uh, one of those cigarette beetles. Um, they're, these little beetles, the cigarette beetles, the carpet beetles, the drugstore beetles, they're all kind of the same size and shape, and they are a little difficult to uh, distinguish from each other. So anytime I see small little um, oval beetles like this, I get a little nervous. Thankfully, I don't see them very often, but um, they, they are, uh, that's the size and shape to be worried about. So you'll see the, I think that's an egg and an adult and then a curled up larva. There's sort of a warehouse beetle, which is kind of a similar size. You'll see the larvae are a little bigger um, and they are also eating books and plant matter and, and that sort of thing. It's a drugstore beetle. So this image, and a lot of the times that you see images where they're kind of showing them uh, 
FBI most wanted style. They'll kind of have them sticking out their antennas and sticking out their legs and, and looking a little bit more like your Egyptian scarab than what they really show up as. So when they're really showing up, their legs are tucked under them, their heads are a little bit tucked down. You don't always see their antennas real well. They're kind of this shiny little brown oval. There's a death watch beetle, again, another another beetle that's uh, potentially going after woody and papery materials. The larder beetle is a little bit bigger, and it, the um, patch, kind of lighter colored patch over its shoulders is pretty distinctive. So that's a pretty good sign. This is one of those protein eaters. So this is something who would eat taxidermy and fur and feathers and leather and wool and anything that's a protein, like something that had once been an animal, essentially. Same thing with this guy, the black carpet beetle. Uh, some materials like horn and baleen and hair, the, what they call the hard keratins, um, those are a little bit less tasty to insects than some of the softer um, softer proteins, but I, I have seen infestations in baleen baskets and things like that too. Here's another one of those little um, little beetles that's a protein eater, the very carpet beetle. Spider beetles are ones that uh, can be attacking your collections, and I've probably seen this particular bug more than a lot of these other bugs, partly because they come in from outside. So they'll be active somewhere outside your building, and they can get in and get in in enough numbers that you're concerned about them. So we saw these in um, the historical library here in Juneau, in the archives in Juneau, and in the city museum in Juneau. And because I had seen them in those three traps at the same time of year, it made me think that it wasn't necessarily infestations in collection. But since we're all around the Telephone Hill area of Juneau, it made me think that Telephone Hill had something outdoors. And so we sealed up that crack between the floor and the wall all around the storage of the archives with a good sealer, and that completely um, got rid of the issue at the archives building. So, um, so they're, they're not one that we wanted around. Furniture beetle, this is kind of like the sort that um, would be infesting, uh, obviously, furniture and picture frames and wooden artifacts, canoes, kayak frames. There's a lot of libraries that have kayak frames hanging from the ceiling. Powder post beetle was the one that the um, Sheldon Jackson Museum had a problem with, um, making the little tiny holes and brass and things. And this this kind of makes this indication that the beetles like kind of hardwoods, kind of good good quality woods, furniture sorts of woods more than conifers and softwoods. So um, fir and spruce and uh, those kinds of woods are not as often attacked by the powder post beetle. Here's our little clothes moth. So this is the one that I showed you on the mitt. So a pretty tiny little guy with um, the edges of his wings are really kind of raggedy looking and pale wings. So pale wings, sometimes pale spotted wings, raggedy ends of the wings, and the little moths that are about the size of the button on the cuff of a button-down shirt. These are protein eaters, and of course they especially like wool clothes. Um, if you've got wool rugs, though, that's kind of another place. Like if you have a, a wool rug that you can just flip over and look under the edge, that's a kind of a spot to look for an infestation. Oh, the um, right, like the cedar. Cedar um, has uh, natural oils in it that repel most insects, and I think that's part of the reason that they use cedar trees and whatnot to make totem poles out of and all, all kinds of other things because it is naturally uh, repellent. And that's not a bad thing to have around if you want to, uh, as kind of a nat more natural uh, repellent sort of thing. This is the case-making clothes moth, which is very similar in size and, and behavior to the webbing clothes moth. So I think you're fine just saying clothes moth. And I've seen both of these in uh, often in museum collections. Usually we catch them when they come in and we get rid of them before they get going or we see evidence of them on things like the infestation is over but we see the little cocoons and the frass and the little webby bits. Yeah, that's pretty pretty common. 
and like I said, you see this on um, taxidermy dolls, beaded wool things, that's, that sort of thing. Ethnographic collections, particularly common. And then back to our not so scary. These guys can be really big. I, they can be as big as your thumb. And so you see one of these guys and you're like, holy cow, but they're totally harmless and they really don't want to be in your building. And if you find one, they're probably um, confused and um, almost dead anyway. Sometimes they can be a little smaller or you can get these little tooth-necked fungus beetles. And tooth-necked means that kind of middle section, sort of their shoulder section, has kind of these little bumps on it. That's why they're tooth-necked. So um, they don't really want to be in your building either. They're mostly eating fungus. but uh, if you do have a lot of them in your building, it might indicate that you've got like things that are molding and, and that sort of thing. So you've got springtails. And springtails have this cool little thing on their, their rear end that's a little bit hard to see. It's this little spike that like makes them bounce ping, ping up in the air. And generally, if you see one, you see them in pretty large numbers. And uh, again, they're the ones that can't really get very far under your traps. So you'll see them along the edges of your traps. And even with the bare eye, you can distinguish these guys from the book lice because these guys are kind of pointed and um, more angular looking, and the book lice are kind of rounder and more muppet, like like with their little roundy noses and whatnot. Um, these guys really like moisture and mold, and uh, like if you have condensation on your windows all winter long and you get that green scum towards the bottom of your windows, they eat that. So it's not. A uh, creature that's going to be eating your collections, but it's really interested in um, mold and high moisture. So it means that you've got dampness somewhere. So with this guy and with the guy after it, the sow bugs and pill bugs, if I see these bugs that I know really like moisture and I see them somewhere I expect moisture, like near the doors or in the basement or under the doormats, if I see them in those places, I'm like, yeah, whatever, that's kind of where they're going to be. But if I saw them, say, in the middle of the reading room, in my collections area, in the museum gallery, I would really worry that there was a leak. Like maybe there was a leak soaking into the carpeting slowly, quietly somewhere that was creating a high moisture situation and some mold. So um, these guys are not going to cause trouble. But if they're where I don't expect them to be, then I'm starting to look for a building problem. And I think, I think that's my last slide. So if anybody has any questions, I am happy to entertain them now, or you're very welcome to uh, to email me, too. So, uh, yeah. Sandy, they're going to have a new library as well. Uh, Christine's going to have a new library. For the new library. Well, we just got a new uh, storage facility for the museum, and we set up uh, uh, little traps around and whatnot started monitoring. And it was probably a good five or six months before we really started getting a sense of what our populations were. But um, uh, something that I have heard is that construction sites are really dirty places. And often construction sites, if they're not very well controlled, have mice and all kinds of other critters. And so I think uh, right away, if you're going to move in collections and kind of settle in, it wouldn't hurt to have a few of these little monitors out to make sure you don't have mice and you know to kind of get a sense of what your resident populations are. So uh, I find it helpful just to have a floor map of the space and to lay some, you know, to put some out. And uh, I tend to leave them out for three months. And, and the reason that I, I do that duration is because um, that's a reasonable amount of time to catch an infestation before it goes too far. And you know, I, I guess not having presented about museums or about libraries before, but mostly about museums, like if you get some of those protein eaters on a piece of taxidermy or on some fur mitts or something like that, they can really go to town and do some a huge amount of damage really fast. It might be that like libraries, if they don't have those kinds of collections, might want to check three times a year instead. But another thing that happens is sometimes traps get kicked or crushed or lost, and that's all lost data. So um, in order to find out that you've lost a trap or a trap's got, gotten soaking wet or isn't working anymore, like checking them every three months is kind of nice. And another uh, thing with checking your traps more frequently is that um, once the there's insects on those traps. Those are food sources for other insects. And other insects will come and eat insects off that trap or lay eggs and insects on that trap or that sort of thing. So you start getting these little uh, 
tiny microsystems going on on your trap. So in order to, to get your data in a timely manner and be able to respond to it three or four times a year is probably optimal. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for joining. And um, you can find me on the internet, you know, the Alaska State Museum and, and probably the libraries and the archives. We have an outreach mandate to provide advice and expertise statewide. And museums call us all the time. And there's no good reason why you couldn't get in touch, too, if you wanted to get this going. All right, Beth, cool. Well, let me know if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to help. Okay.